Today we're going to be talking about change. Let's open, uh, let's look at the definition of change first. To make or become different. I don't know about you, life is, what's that? Oh, thank you. All right. All right. I have something to say to you, bro. Dollars wise, but dollars wise, but cents short, something like that. Okay, all right. Make or become different. How many times in life that we really do get to points in our life that we need change? Amen? Now, the world changes around us, and that's really not what I'm really talking about, although Obviously, the world changing around us has impact on us, but we need change. There's times that we just can't go on the way it is. Isn't that true? And, and, and all through life, we're all going through different things. Um, you know, I, I'm old enough now that I can I try to remember. Try to remember. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> But I do, I remember, I, I'm looking at the young couples here with the children, and it's like yesterday, I remember when Lisa and I had three little teeny kids, and I remember the joke was, not joke, she said, she goes, you know, I went to church with you for five years when the kids were little, yeah, I don't remember really going to church, but I know I was there, you know. <laughs> but we went through those changes and the, the struggles of just life, and you go all these different, you're, all these lines in the sand. And we, wherever we're at in life, we keep coming to new lines in the sand. And it's never that far in between one line and another. It's just amazing. Because you never really get completely settled. We really can't. It's the nature of things. Now, in Jeremiah 7, 5, I like this verse. If you really change your ways and your actions and, deals with the, and deal with each other justly. So, we are able to change our ways. Our ways can change. And we need to say to ourselves sometimes, when we really realize, and there's times that we really get to a place where, and we've all been there, where we get really unhappy. And, and it usually starts you get unhappy with everybody else. Then finally you start to realize, you know, I'm not happy with myself either. <laughs> but, you know, we get mad at everything, everybody else. Pretty soon you're going to get mad at yourself. Because you can't be mad at everybody else without being mad at you. So God said in Jeremiah here, I love this verse, said if you really change your ways and your actions, your actions. Lisa in the discipleship class this morning was teaching on forgiveness. And she was sharing her testimony about when she grew up, and this was a big struggle we had early in our marriage, um, she had an alcoholic stepdad who was extremely violent, uh, physically violent as well as verbally violent. So when we got married, I remember I was at home and sitting in the living room, and I had the newspaper just open on, on the floor in the middle of the living room. And I had the papers like kind of all over. I'm just sitting there, and instead of sitting at the table, I, and Lisa walked in. We were very young in our marriage, and she was like all upset. Look at this mess in here. It, look, you're making a mess. And I'm like, I'm reading the paper. But to her, you see, in her home, when she was five years old, she had to make her bed military style, or there's held things. Now, I didn't grow up like that. My dad was, was an alcoholic, but he, and seldom was he ever violent. He was verbally, but when he wasn't drinking, he was a really, really wonderful guy. So I have a lot of happy memories of being a child. Lisa has almost no happy memories of growing up. So when she truly came to Christ, she struggled then with forgiving him and truly forgiving him and letting him go. And she was able to, with the help of Christ. And, and the, the power of that experience in her life 
forged her then to do the teachings now that she's doing on forgiveness because all of us deal with stuff. All of us get offended. All of us are capable of offending others. All of us are able to, to deal with other people's messes and sometimes we make our own. But God says that we can change our ways and if our ways change, our actions change. I like that. So it's not just enough to change the way, but the action. James 1.20 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I was in a discipleship class for just a few minutes, and Lisa said, when, when you go to forgive somebody, forget about feeling like forgiving. Forget that. That's what, that's what everybody does. I'm going to wait till I feel like forgiving that person, and then I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to wait for an overwhelming, supernatural thing of love to just cover me so that I will forgive that person. You will never forgive 99 out of 100 people, and you won't even forgive the dog. If you're waiting for an emotion, you'll never get that action. So what you have to do, you have to make, in your will and your mind, you have to decide, God, I can't stand that person. I don't even want to think about them. It hurts me to even think about them, but I'm going to think about them right now. God, you know I'm really struggling here, but I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to forgive them, and they owe me nothing. Because if Christ forgave me of thousands and thousands of sins, I must forgive this person of several dozen. And you, in your mind, you say that. Now, if you feel like a hypocrite because you still don't feel good. You may go months without feeling good. You may go a long time without, quote, feeling like forgiving. But you will be able to forgive them, really forgive them, even without the feeling. But don't be surprised once you really forgive them that all of a sudden you know that you have the feeling. You know how you know that you, you actually have really forgiven them? You see them in Walmart and your heart doesn't sink. Anybody been there? I've had trouble with people and I see them in Walmart and I'm, you know, run into the toy section, check out the Hot Wheel cars, you know what I mean. Don't want to see them. And you see them and your heart sinks. Oh, no, there they are. And when you see them, and it's okay. And you can walk up and talk civilly and everything's, you know what I'm saying. I'm not inviting them to over to stay the weekend at my house, no. But, but I have enough forgiveness that if I see them or think about them, it's okay now. It's not devastating. Those memories are no longer treacherous as they once were in our lives. I like that. Because we deceive ourselves if simply hear something that we have to do, because sooner or later we've got to try to do it, okay? If action, now, I wrote this, and I don't like this because there's still things in, in my life that after I wrote this, I go, I don't I want to show everybody this because I don't like what I wrote, but there's a little bit of truth to this. Let's look at it. If action eventually follow what you believe, maybe you don't really believe. If I say I believe in Jesus Christ, but my actions do not reflect him. But I say I believe in him. I doctrinally believe in him. But I will not live after his lifestyle. Then do I really believe in him? Even though I can get an A in the test. You just ask a question. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are past, behold, all things are become new. Now, the problem with that verse is, when we look at it, what's the first thing that we think? We think, well, if I come to Jesus, everything's going to be new. Well, some things really did change right away in my life. And some things are dragging along. Forty-something years ago, I gave my life to Christ. And I, at first, wonderful things happened immediately when I first gave my life to Christ. The Lord delivered me of things right when I came to Christ. I experienced the peace and the love of God that I had never known existed the moment I truly gave my life to Christ. 
I experienced love that I never knew existed the moment that I truly gave my life to Christ. But I am in shock that 40-something years later that I've still got so much, quote, work to do. It's kind of like when you get one end of the house finally painted and done. It took so long doing that project. By the time I got to the other side of the house, everything's out of style on that side. Isn't that kind of with the way it is almost in our hearts almost too sometimes? So we got to keep going. We've got to keep working on this, all right? Amen. But notice, it is not enough to simply believe in Christ. I need to be in him. So America is full of people who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, many of them don't doctrinally believe in him properly, but most Americans believe that he might be the Son of God. That's good. Good start. Probably 70% of Americans would say, who is Jesus? They say he's the Son of God. And if you say, how many believe that? I'll bet you a bulk of them believe it. But how many people are walking for the Lord out there? Not many. <laughs> not many. There's some, but not many. We don't have 70, 60% of Americans walking in Christ. They may believe in him, but they are not walking. So that is why to be in Christ, I can only have new things if I am in Christ. Because without being in Christ, I have no power to change into something that I cannot be by my, by the nature, my sinful nature will not let me become like Christ. But the Holy Spirit is glad to let me become like Christ. Isn't that cool? Hallelujah. Praise God. When people truly encountered Christ, Every one of them had a 100% certainty of life-changing impact by the encounter. Isn't that true? Wherever Jesus was in the Bible, do you notice all the people that wherever he went, it's like where he couldn't even just sit there at a wedding feast without causing trouble. Every funeral he went to, he ruined He'd go to funerals and people would get risen from the dead. He goes to a wedding feast, minding his own business. His mother comes, to, Mary comes to him. Jesus, they're out of wine. <clears throat> He's just sitting there minding his own business. He's never done even any miracles yet. That goes to show that Mary must have believed. She must have believed that, that the time maybe would come. And what does he do? I, and I like this, coming from a Catholic background. I love what, what, Mary's, what Mary told the servants. This is the only command in Scripture that Mary gave. Do whatever my son tells you to do. You want to follow Mary? Follow Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You, you know, if somebody says, oh, I believe in Mary. I said, well, I don't necessarily believe in her. I like what she, the only command she gave in the Bible was, do whatever my son tells you to do. I like that. I like that. In all of Scripture, Mary gave one command. Do whatever Jesus says to do. That's good. You can share that with anybody. It's in there. Hallelujah. So what does Jesus do? He changes the water into wine. And the master of the says, oh, my goodness. You saved the best wine for the last? I mean, usually, you know, when the bride and groom things first get going, you get the good stuff out. You know what I mean? Like, man, when they when they... It wasn't like today, you're there for a half hour, 45 minutes. Well, this might have been all day and sometimes days. And says, you know, we'll get the cheap stuff out later. Because it doesn't matter by then. But you've got to have the good stuff in the beginning, but you saved the best for last. Do you see what I'm saying? So even something at the end turned out to be the best because Jesus touched it. So there's hope for some of us folks that are over 20. Amen. <laughs> Just a little bit. Amen. The past. <laughs> All right? All right. So, woman at the well is a perfect example. John 5, 28 and 28. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And the next verse says that everybody, everybody she talked to then ran she took the, all these mainly men back to see Jesus. A few 
hours ago, or maybe minutes ago. She was a woman that had been married five times, living with a man. And trust me, in that culture, let me tell you, she was a marked woman. Whenever that lady would go to get water from that well, you can bet a whole bunch of the wives in the area made sure that their husbands aren't down there at the same time. Now, I'm not saying she deserved that, but that's in that culture. She, she was, in all fairness, she was a hussy back then. She might not have really been one. She might have simply been abused. She might have simply just had a bad choice with guys. I don't know what the real story is. I know that when Jesus met her, she was surprised that Jesus was talking to her. Because guys like you don't talk to people like me. But you need to understand that the Lord will go anywhere to find someone that will listen from the heart. God sends prophets to go to people that you've condemned that Christ is going to save. There's people groups in the world you couldn't care less about, God cares about. Praise God for that. Do you still believe in the power of the Holy Spirit of God to change you? Do you still believe in the power of the Holy Spirit of God to change you? Ezekiel 36, 26. Many of you will recognize this. This is a wonderful verse in Scripture. Look what it says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Now we've got to understand, this is, this is like a long time ago. What year was Ezekiel around? Was it, I think about 850 years before Christ or something? So we're going back pretty far. This is not a New Testament verse, but it looks like a New Testament verse, doesn't it? Because you see, Elijah is prophesying the coming of the Lord. He, he, this is a prophecy of, of a time that will come. And look what he says. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Move you. God doesn't make you obey but he will move you to obey. Okay? You're on the, you're, you're, you're at the, has this ever happened? And the lady gives you the change, and you realize there's, there's a buck or two extra. And you can look at that and just put it in your pocket and say, well, I've been praying that the Lord will prosper me, but there we go. <laughs> now you probably need to take that money and go right back to the lady and say, listen, you gave me too much money here. You probably need to do that, right? You're on the highway and somebody's driving a little aggressively. Are you going to have platitude or attitude? What's it going to be? Okay? All right? Why am I looking at you? Okay? I have no idea. You just happen to be in my eyesight. Here, I'll look at Maggie instead. Is that better? Okay, hallelujah. Well, she got all convicted over here. Look at her. When, when our church started, we were we, uh, the founding pastor of the church. We had the Knights of Pythian Hall in Menor on Jack Street. It's not a Knights of Pythian Hall anymore. It's a Quando something place. We had the Knights of Pythian. I never heard of that in my life. I only knew the Fred Flintstones, uh, Water Buffaloes, and Knights of Columbus. That's all I knew. You know what I mean? So I go in there, and there's this giant triangle, giant wood thing. thing weighed, I'm not kidding, 700 pounds, and had wheels on it. And Pastor Uri used to have his, he had a big Bible on there, and he'd preach from it. And, you know, he'd say, you're going to hell, he'd say, bad boy, and he'd point it right to you. You know what I mean? You're going to hell. <laughs> you know, ah! <laughs> you know, you, you didn't want him to point you out with, the, with, with that, the lectern, you know what I mean? Oh, man, that reminded me of that. Hallelujah. Amen. So, but I will, put my, I will move you to follow my decree. I will not make you follow my decrees, but I will move you. You need to understand that whenever the Holy Spirit gives you an inclination, there is always empowerment. Think about that. 
The Lord never gives you inclination without empowerment. What am I saying? I'm saying that, first of all, we need to understand that not everything is, is necessarily a conviction. Because there are many things that are not, you're not being convicted about something wrong. Many times the Spirit is attempting to lead us to do something right. It has nothing to do with doing something wrong. So there's times that we are, we are led to do things from the Lord, and it's not a right and wrong thing. Then there's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, which convicts us of sin, and we can repent and be cleansed from that. But many, many times, I'm not talking about being convicted. I'm simply talking about the Lord leading you, showing you something that, that you got to do, doing something for somebody. You just have that, that thing to where you just know, I've got to show kindness to that person. You're in Walmart, and there's eight people in front of you, and she's having trouble with the computer. Some ladies up there can't find her, her credit card. And all the people in front there, have you just ever have to look at you like, oh, no, no, no. You know, kind of like being at McDonald's. Yeah, fast food, you know. Okay. And everybody's got an attitude in front of you, and you know how easy it is to just join in. But maybe the Holy Spirit will tell you, you know, when you get up to that lady, Look at her right in the eye and say, you know what? You're going to have a good day today because I just prayed for you. Your day's going to get better. And, thank, and thanks, thanks. God bless. Some simple word. So you're not convicted to do that. You're led. You understand what I'm saying? Now, there's times that if you don't do what the Lord obviously is telling you, it turns into conviction. <laughs> Amen? I remember one time there was a guy sitting in a coffee shop in Canesville, and he was just sitting there having his coffee, and I didn't know who he was. And, uh, man, I felt the Spirit tell me, talk to the guy. And he was very, at first, real polite and gentle, you know. Talk to him about me. And I wasn't even sitting by him. I was sitting at a table about 20 feet away. And I just, you know how it is. I don't know. You know, the guy's reading the paper, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to impose. So the Lord then was, kept saying, I want you to talk to him. And it, it got, got a little more serious. Well, then the guy got up and left. Now it's getting real serious. <laughs> you want to talk to him? No, now it is like the Lord is saying, look, I want you to talk to him. So I got up, went outside. He was already about 50 steps away, going down the I ran down, chased him down, and I told him what happened just now. I said, look, you're, you're going to think I'm nuts, but let me tell you what just happened. So instead of just starting to witness to him, I let him know that God was chasing him down. And he was all ears once I told him what had happened. He says, I'm trying to just enjoy my lunch. I couldn't enjoy my lunch because God wanted me to tell you something. I was on a cruise ship. Second cruise, and there was a lady there. She was probably about 75 years old, beautifully dressed. You could tell she was an extremely wealthy woman. And she, we were in one of the areas of the cruise ship where they had some, a guy playing the piano, and he's, you know, we're just sitting there just listening to some of the old tunes. And the Holy Spirit told me, go to that lady and, and tell her something. And I said, oh, okay. So, and I didn't do it. And then finally I went and I told her. And i got to be honest, she was totally... Couldn't have cared less what I said. But remember, how someone responds is not the issue. You obey. Because you do not know. That lady was cold as ice with me. She couldn't have cared less that I told her what I told her. I had some things that I felt the Lord wanted me to tell her, and I told her, and she just looked at me, thank, mm -hmm, thank you. And she didn't even look at me. And you could just tell she, it, it, it didn't matter. But you know what? I don't know what happened to her. Because maybe she had a stroke in a few months or something. Maybe she was laying in a hospital bed, and maybe she remembered that word that I gave. Do you see what I'm saying? You need to understand whatever God gives you to give to somebody. You've you got to understand, everything that God gives people, they don't use right away because you don't use everything right away. Things were spoken into my life for many years down the road that I had no idea that it would be that significant, and then all of a sudden it becomes significant. All of a sudden, something that somebody said 22 years ago matters. Isn't that cool? Because you see, God has a whole lifetime to accomplish his will. Isn't that cool? 
I used to get so frustrated because I, I got a witness to everybody in the world right now. And trust me, I, if you knew me when I was first saved, it was not, I was not real polite sometimes. It's like, I got to tell everybody right now, get over here, get over here, get, you know, it's your turn. All right, get over here, you know. And I mean, I'd be places and just be like a wild man. And it's like, wow, I realize, you know what, my job isn't to save everybody anymore. It never was. When I was first saved, I really took it kind of scary, scarily serious. This is all up to me. And now I know that God's got all kinds of tools in the toolbox besides myself. He's got you and you and you. So that when you're out and you're at Walmart or you're at a gas station or you're talking to that relative that's going through trial, you are the preacher. You're the prophet. You're the evangelist. It's not all up to me car show, it's not all up to me to talk to hundreds of people. It's up to dozens of us to talk to hundreds of people. Show the love of Christ to every single one of the person that comes around. When every person comes on this property to experience that sense that they're loved. And we're going to tell the truth, but they're going to know they're loved. They may not like to hear some of the things that we're going to say, but they're going to leave and they're going to, you know, I don't like it when Pastor Jim puts the trophy has to talk about death and dying and God and whatever whatever he's doing. I don't like that. But you know, they keep coming back and lining up for the hamburgers. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. 960. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now here's a guy who gave Jesus some lame excuse why he can't follow him yet. Okay? But I believe there's a spiritual principle in this verse. Okay? Anything that can't be resurrected should be buried and stay there. Only people are going to be resurrected. But that heartache, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, those memories that haunt us sometimes, we're allowed to bury them and let them stay there. Because when we are buried with Christ, hallelujah, we, we, we die to sin. And the power that the things of death in this world have had over us no longer have dominion in your life. Amen. Give them a praise. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now here's the good part. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you don't conform, then you can be transformed. But if, I, if, if, if you say that you, you're trying to love Jesus, but you just still go with everything in the world, everything in the world just pulls you in, then you need to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Because if you keep conforming, you're resisting transforming. Get it? Now, every single true believer in Jesus Christ, I believe, and this is my prejudice, I admit it, I believe every believer needs structural Bible study. I believe that. I don't believe that you're probably, it's not a matter, I want you to study privately, but I've my, my gut feeling is that people that never, ever, 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 ever go to Bible studies, most of those people never, ever, ever study the Bible privately. That's been my experience. So I'm going to encourage you to get into Bible study. We have many Bible studies that we have here. Okay, here in other places. Denny's, we're at Denny's every Wednesday from 11 to 12.30. We're here on Thursday night from 6.30 to 7.30. We have the men's group this Wednesday. We always have a powerful devotion here, okay? The ladies meet once a month here. There's always a devotion. We have Sunday school class. We have the discipleship training class. We have the grieving workshop that Mary does in, in the back room there. So the, you're going to, all I'm saying is I want to invite all of you to start to seriously consider because until you know the word of God, you cannot be transformed. If you've got a bad something in your computer, it's got to go out. You've got to upgrade. The Word of God is an upgrade. Hallelujah. And there's times you just got to take the old stuff out. 
and put the new program in. Hallelujah. Amen? Romans 8, 5 through 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. It's why we die in this world. We die in this world because Adam and Eve, the cost of sin was imputed into humankind. They walked, they talked with God, but they sinned and they fell. And all humankind has followed in that. But Jesus came to change the destiny of all mankind when he died on the cross for our sins. By the way, next Sunday, we're going to be having communion. Many of you have been asking, when are we having communion next Sunday? Okay, hallelujah. So the mind governed by the flesh, flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. How many want peace? How many want peace? Amen? Hallelujah. All right. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. That's why you must get out of the realm of flesh and into the realm of the presence of God. And believe it or not, the realm of the presence of God isn't necessarily a feeling. In fact, many, many times the realm of his presence has nothing to do with how you feel. It's simply knowing God is with me. Knowing I am not alone. Hallelujah. Because you see, his spirit in this world is more powerful than all the demons in hell put together. There's no comparison. I hate to say it, it's an unfair fight. Because we struggle with the flesh, it appears to us that this is like an even fight. Do you know what I'm saying? Doesn't it feel that way sometimes? Like, oh, the power of evil is so strong in the world. Well, yes, but not really. Because once you overcome that thing that you're dealing with, and you go way beyond to where your, your identity, remember this, you know you're really getting in better shape when your identity is no longer what's wrong with you, rather things that are right with you. You know, look at Joe over there. Oh, yeah, Joe, man, that guy. Whew, boy, don't talk about anything with him, I'm telling you. It's going to be, you're not going to like what's going to happen. You bring up anything. Stay away from this, 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 this. Why? Because he just is, he's like, he's just ready to blast off. What about Susie over here? Oh, <laughs> stay away from her too, you know what I mean. Well, what's wrong with Susie? Oh my goodness, you can't talk to her for two minutes without her telling you all her problems and things and everything, and she, she hates her ex-husband and this, that, and the next thing. Well, okay, well, what about sit over there? You know, you know, I don't think I want to hang around here. I, I just, you know, I... I just want to find somebody to talk to. You know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so, but the point is, it's cool because now, you know, what about what about Susie over there? Oh man, she, Lord touched her by the Holy Spirit. Praise God, she was at a revival service and the Holy Ghost got a hold of her, and now she's doing teachings in the church about being delivered of hatred towards ex-husbands. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. You know what I'm saying? What about Joe? Oh, man, he was a hopeless alcoholic for 20 years, lost his home, his business, his, his family and everything, but he got delivered. He hasn't touched a drop of alcohol in 15 years. The Lord gave him a beautiful wife. He's, he's, he, everything that the enemy stole from him, he's got back and more. Hallelujah. Yeah! So you start when people start knowing you for, the, for what God has done rather than what the enemy already did. Amen? Hallelujah! Praise God. Romans 8, 9. Let's stand as we close in prayer. You, however, are not in the realm of flesh. You may still sin in the flesh, but biblically, you are not in the realm of flesh. When we sin, we are offending the, the, the spiritual realm that Christ died on the cross to place us in. Let me give you an example. Let's say uh, I'm going to a wedding in a few weeks. A guy in my Mustang club, his daughter's getting married, and he wants me to come to the wedding. Okay, And they're going to, you know, I think it's going to be pretty gussied up. 
everybody's going to have tuxes on, whatever. Well, I'm going to get my cleanest Lakeshore Assembly Motorsports t-shirt. I'm going to the wedding. Okay? No. No, I'm going to, I'm going to dress up. I'm going to dress up as much as I can. Okay? The point is, if I were to go there, even in a clean t-shirt, well, if you were there, what would you think if you saw me walk? What is wrong with that? This is not an atmosphere for his motorsport t-shirt. Okay, what is wrong? How come he didn't think that through? Do we understand that's it's not a great example, but it's a little bit of an example. Something inappropriate at the wrong time. And in essence, to remain in the flesh when Christ has already placed us in the realm of his Holy Spirit, it's improper. It's improper for you to swear like the world. It's improper for you, okay, to drink booze like the world. It's improper for you to gamble like the world. It's improper for you to sexually do things like the world and to think like the world. It's improper. There's an in, It's inappropriate. God, it's not even an issue that God doesn't like. It. Deep down, believe it or not, you don't either. When your eyes are open, when we really open our eyes to the holiness of God and we realize what a treasure it is that I am allowed and now I have the power to not be like everybody else in the world. Because believe it or not, Jesus called the church to be different than any other structural organization. There's nothing on earth like the church. The church is called to be different than anything else on the planet. There's nothing else on the planet like the church when it comes to this. Amen? Woo! Oh, here, I didn't finish that verse. Okay. All right. But you're in the realm of the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And I'm confident most, I know most of you, some I don't, whether I know you or not, it doesn't matter. You know, you ever remember that little card we used to pass out? If you meet me and forget me, you've lost what? Nothing. But if you meet him and forget him, you've lost everything. So it doesn't matter what I know. Matters what God knows. Matters what you and your own conscience know. Amen? We're going to close this with Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So that you're going to have the power to not be mopey all the time, sometimes, okay? Mopey in the morning, get your morning coffee, do your devotions, you're good to go. Hallelujah. But, but you got to, do you understand what I'm saying? Go to Lowe's, get a ladder, get over it. Hallelujah. It's, it's, you got to get through things. I'm not saying you can't struggle in the process. I'm telling you, you have the hope that it is not always going to be like this. If it is that hard today, I promise you that if you love God and give Him everything, two weeks from now, Things will be different. The light will start coming in. The weight will start to lift. Hallelujah. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is peace in the name of Jesus Christ. And whether you like it or not, you're allowed to have it because God loved you so much that before the foundations of the world, you were already on His mind when He was dying on the cross. Woo! like preaching. Praise God. Glory to God. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for this glorious morning that you've given us. Father, I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters here, God. Whatever they have needed from you today, I know many, many here have humbled themselves and received of you things that they need. Some are here, perhaps, you're just beginning your journey. That's okay. That's okay. You know, I go on vacation, even if I take a jet, i got to get on the jet. <laughs> One thing beautiful about serving God, wherever you're at, don't get overwhelmed that people are way down the highway ahead of you. Just get on that old entrance ramp, nail it. Get that right foot spiritually, nail it. Get up to speed, people that love Jesus. They won't be like people on the highway usually, they'll let you in. Hallelujah. Amen? We merge into traffic because we're all going in the same direction to know and to obey our God. Hallelujah. Amen? Is there anyone here this morning you say, Pastor Jim, 
as you preach today, I've really sensed it's something I just got to give to the Lord. Maybe it's your life. Are you here this morning and you say, I am not saved? When, when, when I say that, you don't know what I mean, but, deep, but you know in your heart, I think I need that. Raise your hand if that's you. Many in the sanctuary have come to the Lord the last few months. Is there anyone? How many would say, I'm dealing with some things in the flesh, and it's power in my life, and I need to get in that spiritual place so that I have supremacy over my flesh. I don't want my flesh to win. I want the Spirit of God to win. So today I'm, I'm humbling myself. I'm admitting I have something. I'm going to turn it over to God this morning. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Praise God. Father, for these six or seven that raise their hands, I pray this week will be a week of blessing, a week of victory, a week of, of, of just, God, that you're going to open and increase their understanding of your ways and their heart. You love us with an everlasting love. We are so thankful. So, God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who we are becoming in you. Hallelujah. Help us forgive ourselves. Help us forgive others. And help us to completely trust that you have forgiven us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Give them praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.